Wir haben in Europa durchgängig. We have consistently transatlantically corrupted elites in Europe. In my view, this has a lot to do with the second Iraq war in 2003. At that time, Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder, French President Jacques Chirac, and Russian President Vladimir Putin decided not to participate in this illegal war of aggression by the Americans, which resulted in hundreds of thousands of deaths. In Washington, the neoconservative circles in the foreign policy establishment decided that this must not happen again. They wanted to enforce compliance and replaced personnel. Today we see politicians all over Europe who follow this American policy because they have made their careers in transatlantic organizations. Hallo zusammen und willkommen zurück auf Neutrality Studies. Hello everyone and welcome back to Neutrality Studies. Today I have the great pleasure of speaking with Patrick Barb one of Germany's most important journalists and intellectuals. For years, he has been publicly engaging with the topic of the Ukraine conflict and the role of the media in it. Patrick Barb is the author of the Spiegel bestseller On Both Sides of the Front, in which he reports on his experiences traveling in the Donbass. He was also an editor for Norddeutsche Rundfunk for many years and a lecturer at two universities in Germany. Just before we started the interview, he told me that his new book titled Propaganda, Press, How Media and Paid Writers Drive Us to War is coming out. Today we want to talk about his work and his analyses. Mr. Barb, welcome. Hello, Mr. Lotaz, good morning. Guten Morgen. Fangen wir vielleicht mit de, mit Ihrer Erfahrung als Journalist und jetzt auch und Buchautor. An. Let's perhaps start with your experience as a journalist and author, because a lot has happened to you in recent years. On the one hand, as a former employee of NDR, and on the other hand, you just told me that your books are not sold everywhere in Germany, even though they are officially bestsellers on the Spiegel bestseller list. Why is that? Um, was mit was hat das zu tun? This has to do with the so-called cancel culture, a culture of censorship and suppression of knowledge. The bookstores, the media, and also the governments follow NATO's propaganda. An element of this propaganda is to obscure knowledge. My accusation is directed at the media, the ideological apparatuses as a whole, and also at commerce. They lie by omission. An example is the largest bookstore in Berlin, Dussmann on Friedrichstrasse. My book on both sides of the front, about my travels in Ukraine, is not sold there. Auf beiden Seiten der Front, meine Reisen in die Ukraine. Ein Buch, das berichtet aus der Westukraine, aber auch aus der... A book that reports from Western Ukraine, but also from the Donbass, which is currently occupied by Russia, was ranked 13th on the Spiegel bestseller list. In the bestseller shelf at Dusman, the first 12 places were present and marked. The 13th place was empty, the number was removed, and it continued with place 14. Here, an attempt is being made to censor a book that explicitly does not align with the government line, but instead conducts an on-site reality check. This reality check is being suppressed because the trade follows government propaganda. I also know and can prove that intelligence agencies are intervening here. Ich weiß auch und ich kann es auch belegen, dass hier Geheimdienste intervenieren. Ob das beim deutschen Buchhandel so war, kann ich nicht sagen, aber ich weiß, dass Whether this was the case with the German book trade, I cannot say. But I know that German intelligence agencies approach employers, landlords and banks and say they don't want any trouble. They would like to see this or that person's account closed or for them to do this or that. This is a controversial person we are keeping an eye on. In anticipatory obedience, landlords, employers or banks often react and cause trouble for the affected individuals. This is a classic sign of a dictatorship. Und dies ist ein klassisches Zeichen einer Diktatur. 
ich weiß nicht mehr, war es Olaf Scholz? Nein, wer war es, der verkündet hat, dass wir jetzt I don't know. in Deutschland Was it Olaf Scholz? Um, no. Wir, um, Who was it that announced that we are now living in the best Germany of all time? And for years, we have been learning that censorship in the media does not come directly from the government, which dictates to media houses what they can or cannot publish. Instead, the media regulate themselves through self-censorship. The German state is increasingly taking brutal action against people who do not conform to what is happening. This was extremely strong during Corona. And now, from what I hear from my friends in Germany, also during the Ukraine war, we are again finding mechanisms of suppressing dissenters in society. How do you explain that on the one hand, we have this announcement of the best Germany of all time, and on the other hand, a very clear, undeniable application of authoritarian mechanisms in the state? Ein Anziehen dieser, dieser autoritären Mechanismen im Staate. Propaganda Sprüchen wie wir leben im besten Deutschland aller Zeiten. Propaganda Slogans like we live in the best Germany of all time can only be answered with Voltaire's Candide, who in this satirical tale asks, if this is supposed to be the best Germany of all time, what do the others look like? And this is not the best Germany of all time. Rather, in my eyes, the traffic light coalition is the worst government the Federal Republic of Germany has ever had. Olaf Scholz is a chancellor of economic decline. He tacitly accepts the terrorist attack on the Nord Stream pipeline in the Baltic Sea, allegedly by an ally, namely the United States. Durch die Sanktionen fügt er der deutschen Wirtschaft schwersten Schaden. Through the sanctions, he is causing severe damage to the German economy and thereby also to the people here. The Traffic Light Coalition is a government of post-democracy, which dismantles fundamental rights, enables and intensifies censorship. The Democracy Promotion Act by Interior Minister Nancy Faeser is essentially a democracy destruction act. If it passes as it is, this law is supposed to enable the criminal prosecution of political opponents. This too is a classic sign of a dictatorship, and shows where the journey is heading. The Traffic Light Coalition itself is dismantling fundamental rights and destroying the economic foundations of the country. In doing so, it is paving the way for the AfD. Und damit bereitet sie den Boden für die AfD. Is she doing this out of stupidity or out of subservience to foreign interests, particularly the USA? How do you explain this decline of Germany? Like Goethe's Gretchen, half pulled her, half she sank. This is of course compliance with the United States and the directives from Washington. The ruling party cartel aims to enforce a policy of war and social breakdown that targets its own population. But it is also an attempt by an extremely weak government to maintain power. Look at the election results of the SPD and you will see how weak they are. Schauen Sie sich die Wahlergebnisse der SPD an, dann wissen Sie, wie schwach die sind. Die eigentlichen Treiber dieser Entdemokratisierung, das ist vor The real drivers of this de-democratization are primarily the Greens. The Greens are also the party most strongly corrupted by transatlantic influences. If you look at Ms. Lang and Ms. Baerbach, you see people who may not be directly on Washington's payroll, but who have built their careers with the support of transatlantic organizations. This has consequences. I assume that these people no longer represent the interests of the German population. These are also people who probably already have higher offices in mind. There was a time when being chancellor or foreign minister was the highest one could achieve. But a woman like Baerbock, who is now 43 years old, so still well under 50, can imagine that one might rise to NATO or the EU Commission. There are many interests behind these individuals. They do not do what is good for Germany, but what they believe is good for the greater whole. Do you also see this as a driving motivation for these people? Well, the program is me, myself and I. Me, me, me. 
and then there's nothing for a long time, and then come the others. What stands out is that with this top personnel, the personal desire for recognition clearly outweighs the abilities. I see this especially in young women like Ms. Baerbach or Ms. Kallas from Estonia, but also in many others. I recently attended a background discussion at the German Council on Foreign Relations. There, the then political director at the Foreign Office and current ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany to Canada, Sabine Sparwasser, said, we currently do not support proposals from the global south to end the war in Ukraine. My companion and I looked at each other. Then another woman from the German Council on Foreign Relations, who appeared to be heavily pregnant, steps forward and says, If Putin wants war, he shall have it. I don't know if these ladies think about their children or if they have any idea at all what war means. I have been in three wars. I have an idea of what war means. And now there are people who have made their careers by carrying briefcases for others, coming up with such statements. Therefore, my judgment, with this personnel, the desire for recognition surpasses their abilities. And let me tell you something else. When top political personnel remain at the level of child language acquisition, anyone who can speak three German sentences without error seems like a Putin sympathizer. That is the dilemma of today's political discussion. Mr. Bath, what frightens me so incredibly is that in my conversations with other colleagues in Europe, I keep hearing that people in Europe are currently preparing. I recently heard this from a colleague in Finland. In Finland, the question in the public media is not whether the war is coming, but when. And I keep hearing, the war is coming, the war is coming. And if we are already mentally preparing ourselves for the war to come, then we should not be surprised when it actually arrives. Of course, we already have war in Europe. The war is in Ukraine, and Ukrainians are bleeding, and Russians are bleeding. The question is whether it will get bigger or not. This constant preparation for more war that we see in the media is horrifying to me. We are in danger of entering a fifth general war within 100 years. Can you explain, perhaps in the German context, where this pro-war narrative in the media is coming from at the moment? In my perception, the media have descended to being NATO's sycophants. Whatever the NATO press office spits at them, they eagerly lap up. This has causes. First, the propaganda, which extends very far. Second, the ownership structures of the media. Third, the social upheavals when entering this profession. Fourth, the working conditions themselves, which have become increasingly worse. And fifth, the digitalization and the way it impacts the media. These factors amplify each other. First, propaganda. Years ago, more than 27,000 PR professionals were working for the United States Pentagon alone. We are not yet talking about the White House, the entire U.S. administration, or the CIA. We are also not talking about NATO or the federal press office. While at the same time, staff was being cut in the editorial offices. I know this myself as an editor. You can also download statements from Jens Stoltenberg from the NATO website or the NATO press office. Yes, that is certainly more convenient than traveling to Brussels and conducting your own interview. It also saves costs. Secondly, the ownership structures in the media. In recent decades, we have experienced a strict monopolization in the media sector. This means that fewer and fewer corporations own more and more media outlets. The publicist Paul Seth wrote more than 50 years ago, freedom of the press is the freedom of 200 people in Germany to spread their opinion. And this has become even sharper and harder in the meantime. Und diese Konzerne, denen die Medien gehören, die haben Interessen. 
And these corporations that own the media have interests. The corporate executives have interests that are very closely aligned with the interests of the governments. For a very simple reason. The key players meet on the golf course over the weekend. I once tried to make this clear to some ignoramuses at my former broadcaster NDR. The deep state is not when five people meet in disguise at four in the morning in an underground garage. The deep state is the Elbschausi. These agreements are made in full public view, and then it is passed on through official channels the next morning. Thirdly, I spoke of social deformations that occur when entering journalism. I still remember this from my own biography. In den Journalismus einzusteigen. Ich weiß das noch aus der eigenen Biografie. Dazu bedarf es einer ganzen Reihe von Praktika, Internships in Redaktion. This requires a whole series of internships. Internships in editorial offices, which are often not paid at all. Usually only children from affluent, upper middle class backgrounds can afford this. And this leads to social selection. These are predominantly people for whom unemployment, housing shortages, and financial constraints are biographically foreign. And that's why these issues also recede in reporting later on, because they simply do not play a role in the biographies of the decision makers. But these decision makers who come from the upper middle class often hope to inherit their parents' stock funds. And if a stock fund is well diversified, it also includes defense stocks. So they indirectly benefit from this war in Ukraine. Also profitieren Sie indirekt von diesem Krieg in der Ukraine. Das sagen Sie aber nicht, sondern Sie sagen, wir müssen... They don't say that. Instead they say we have to help the poor Ukrainians against the evil Putin. And that is hypocritical. Fourth, the working conditions in the media. Look, I was a freelancer for 15 years. As a freelancer, you offer your boss a topic three times in a row that he doesn't want. Well, you always have to think about it. It doesn't fit into the program today, or it doesn't fit into the paper today. Well, you have to be very careful. By the fourth time, you get it. Then you will offer your boss a topic that you think he will take. For a very simple reason. You get paid by the broadcast minutes or by the lines. And at the end of the month, you have to pay your rent. And so, as a young freelance employee, you adopt the mindset and evaluation criteria of your superiors, the decision makers. It's like a brain implant. And that is exactly what anticipatory obedience is. You end up thinking like them, you don't even notice it anymore. And that's why these people no longer notice their gradual adaptation. The American writer Upton Sinclair wrote many, many years ago, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. And that is correct, that's true. And now comes digitalization. Media consumption today is largely consumption via smartphones. I experienced that myself as well. Das erlebe ich ja bei mir selbst auch. Man steht in der U-Bahn hier in Berlin. You stand in the subway here in Berlin, everything is shaking, and you get jostled. In the morning, it's crowded, and you look at the news on your smartphone and read it. That means it's no longer something you fully concentrate on. Accordingly, the perception times during reception become shorter. With short perception times, it's no longer about substantive depth, context, and background, but about the immediate emotional perception impulse. One could pointedly say that information is being replaced by the mobilization and monetization of resentments. The binding of emotions creates attention and click numbers. This is how the media work today. So information is being replaced by the mobilization and monetization of resentments. It's no longer about research. It's about personalizing, scandalizing, and dramatizing, and denouncing, because denunciation is easy to understand. But the background of this Ukraine war is very complicated and goes far back into history. One has to think about it. And that no longer happens. All these factors together lead to a post-factual dissemination of information. It's no longer about information and factual accuracy, but about stimulating and emotionally arousing the perceiver, the reader, the viewer.
ich gebe Ihnen absolut recht. Ich versuche mich immer einfach noch zu erklären. I absolutely agree with you. I am still trying to understand how it can be that many people do not perceive this as such a process. Because something we have clearly seen or see in the reporting on the Ukraine conflict is this extreme emotionalization and also the demonization of the explanation. So, to explain why Russia decided to cross the borders with tanks and military personnel on February 24, 2022, that would be a neutral description. When it is described as an invasion, the word invasion is already laden with significant and charged meanings. Or, if one were to say, for example, a peacekeeping mission, as is often done, so peacekeeping, or if one uses the Russian word for a military special operation, then one is already entering a framing. It is astonishing that many people do not notice that they are already in a very narrow framing in the general reporting of the mainstream media. Can you explain why this is not noticed? People like you and me immediately notice these words when a framing appears before us, but many others do not. I would like to especially ask the people in Germany to think about a quote from Frederick the Great. The aggressor is the one who forces the opponent to take up arms. This quote goes back to Machiavelli. For Frederick the Great had read Machiavelli. He knew him. This is an important consideration to understand this Ukraine war. The Russians have started a war of aggression in violation of international law. But the war has a history. It is anything but an unprovoked war of aggression. I just want to point out that the government in Kyiv shelled its own compatriots in the Donbass with artillery, rockets, and mines between 2014 and 2021. More than 14,000 people have lost their lives, including a large number of civilians. This is also part of the overall picture that the war has a prehistory in a civil war that was tolerated, even promoted, by the West. This is not how peace can be achieved. But regarding the reaction of the people, two factors catch my eye. The first has to do with the economic and social conditions, especially in Germany but also in the United States, Great Britain, France, and Poland. These are all neoliberal countries. Das sind alles neoliberale Länder. Im Neoliberalismus ist die Wirtschaftsordnung, ist der Staat gegeben. In Neoliberalism, the economic order and the state are characterized by social cutbacks, privatizations, and the individualization of life risks. This means for families that where one salary used to be sufficient, today two salaries are required to adequately support a family. If the parents have two children need to pay off a house or have an apartment in the inner city, they are running around all day. When, please, are these parents supposed to have time to think about the news? It simply doesn't work. The second point is, as we have seen, especially during the corona crisis, a governance strategy of states, particularly in crisis mode, is the mobilization of fears. It is about enforcing anticipatory obedience by generating fear. And there are many who want to compensate for this fear, or unconsciously compensate for it by leaning on authorities, the strong state, the big brother, and moving in its shadow. This extends to the arrogance of borrowed power from people like Miss Thetter, Bookster from the Ethics Commission. And only about a third of the population here is directly resilient. In Germany, these are primarily the people in the eastern part of the country. Because the older generation experienced these state repression mechanisms and the generation of fear during the times of the GDR. Many people here in the eastern part of Berlin, in Saxony, Thuringia, Saxony-Anhalt and Mecklenburg-Western Pomerania tell me 
We've been through all this before. We won't fall for it again. But especially the people in West Germany who grew up in a higher level of prosperity and in a more democratic state have not learned this resilience and this insight in their lives. And they fall for these mechanisms of oppression. On the one hand, people are driven by economic circumstances. It is all very difficult. Germany is losing its level of prosperity. One must be clear about that. Meanwhile, Russia is gaining in family prosperity, albeit still at a modest level. On the other hand, people themselves contribute to their own oppression by believing that they can cope with their fears by leaning on the stronger. This is the question Spinoza asked, why do you long for your oppression as if it were your salvation? And this question is valid. How much of these mechanisms has to do with the fact that we like to believe we are on the right side of history? That we like to feel that this time we are doing everything right? It is almost grotesque to me how we keep hearing this from the German government, that one must stand behind Israel to combat anti-Semitism when it comes to taking a stance in the conflict with Hamas, or that one must stand behind Ukraine, not behind Ukraine, but behind those who want more war to end this fight. And much behind it also has to do with these values, this discourse on values, and no longer with a recognition of realities, as we have worked out from journalism or research. So if A leads to B to C to D, but much more is being talked about, morality and values. How do you see this discourse on values? How is it linked with the other mechanisms that are currently influencing the public in Germany and Europe? This is a difficult question because every psychoanalyst and every social psychologist knows that psychological questions questions of guilt and emotional processing also need to be historicized. This means that in different social formations, social psychology and people's processing capacity always look different. Therefore, we need to make this concrete. If I may explain this once for the Federal Republic of Germany and how I view it today, we have, of course, and my family is also entangled in this, inflicted immense suffering on the people in the Soviet Union. With a war of aggression that violated international law, had we already had a sophisticated international law at that time, with the attack on the Soviet Union. About 27 million dead, that was almost a quarter of the population at the time. And the victims of the siege of Leningrad are still not recognized by the Federal Republic of Germany as victims of a war crime. Not to this day. The federal government resists this because then compensation payments would be due. And that is a level of guilt and responsibility that is very hard to digest. Of course, I, coming from a family that was also deeply involved, am not personally responsible for what my ancestors did. But I am somewhat responsible for ensuring that this does not happen again. And there is a way, excuse me. That's exactly the question. Yes, and there is a way to shift this guilt away from oneself by saying, I am finally on the side of the good. Then, so to speak, I can take this mountain of guilt off my shoulders, breathe again, and point fingers at others. And this process occurs when someone like Ms. Baerbach stands up and says, I am here in Frankfurt in the auditorium, and my grandfather already stood here. I am standing on the shoulders of my grandfather, who fought against the Russians back then. The historical truth is being destroyed. The actual history is being turned upside down. Why is it being turned upside down? Because it benefits the self-importance of a person living today and their American whisperers.
Und so wird versucht, neue Narrative zu bauen zur Kompensation. And so attempts are made to build new narratives to compensate for guilt. Let me say one more thing. Many German families had victims in the Battle of Stalingrad. This also triggers a subliminal anger, because someone perished miserably at the front, starved or froze to death. Often there are no clues at all about what happened to the great-grandfathers. There is already a subliminal anger present, which has been kept in check by the guilt complex and responsibility. Perhaps there is an unconscious longing to be able to release the anger over this loss again. And I believe that is where we are today. Über diesen Verlust wieder rauslassen zu können. Und ich glaube, da sind wir heute. Kann es, das sein, Ganze, ja? kann es sein, dass wir, dass wir gedacht haben, dass Is it possible that we thought we had processed the Second World War? That we in Western Europe believed that it was finally consigned to history? I think the Russians still perceive this war very differently. But we in the West thought it was over. And we didn't realize that we never really processed it, that we never truly dealt with what happened during the war. Perhaps also because the question of guilt towards our own citizens, the Jews in Germany and Europe, is so immense. That overshadowed so much that we completely forgot that we also did terrible things to many other nations. And I say we, because my great-granduncle on my mother's side also died on the Eastern Front, as a Nazi in the SS. Did we never process that? Um, das sind, das, haben wir das nie verarbeitet? Einer meiner besten Freunde, Professor Robert. One of my best friends, Professor Robert E. H. Kirby, with whom I wrote a book, is an American Jew. And one of my best friends here in Berlin is Jewish. This does not lessen the suffering of the Jewish people. When a German says that everything was much worse because we did not only kill Jews but also many others, it is a reduction of guilt and responsibility. In official memorial events, it is often pretended that we only killed Jews. That is bad enough, but there were also many others. There were also Poles. I would like to tell you a story. I agree with you 100%. The city of Wartau has a wonderful Jewish museum, a great museum, much better than the one in Berlin. It says much more about Jewish history. Very excellently done. My Polish friend Przemek did not want to go in when I wanted to visit the museum. I asked him, Yes, Przemek, why don't you want to go in? It's interesting. He said, We Poles have also suffered. This brings about something like a competition of victims. And that is very unfortunate. Und das ist ganz unglücklich. Man muss, finde ich, das Leid I believe one must acknowledge the suffering of others, even if one has suffered oneself. And it is important to me that we do not overlook this. The responsibility lies in ensuring that these things do not happen again. Therefore, I say clearly and unequivocally, it is not anti-Semitism to criticize the Netanyahu government for what it is doing in Gaza. That is not anti-Semitism. That is a recognition of political realities. I place great importance on this. One must not blur the lines. This is exactly what is being attempted to push through political interests. Zu folgen und um politische Interessen durchzusetzen. Das ist ja offensichtlich. That's quite obvious. I never thought about the possibility that it might also be related to the perception of the Second World War. I was so deeply immersed in the mindset of the Cold War and the revolution of 1989-90, the transformation of Europe, that I never considered that part of what is happening now is not only related to the Cold War, but also to the war before it. We have not yet mentally and psychologically emerged from this spiral, and might be continuing it now. In your travels to Ukraine and Russia, how significant is the Second World War in Russia and Ukraine in the perception of current events? The Second World War was a fundamental turning point for all people in Eastern Europe and the memory of it is kept alive in different ways. But it plays a significant role in all countries east of Berlin. I recently visited friends in Petersburg again, 
We were near Pushkin in a large palace park. The background was that a friend of mine has a 16-year-old daughter who is learning German at the Goethe Institute. The mother wanted her to have a conversation with a native speaker. That worked out well. So we walked through the palace park and talked in German and Russian. Then we came to an old orangery that is completely shot up. This is a memorial plaque. This happened during the siege of Leningrad. And the orangery is not being rebuilt, as a reminder. The rest is wonderfully restored. It is excellent. It's a wonderful park, an Italian park in Eastern Europe. This also shows that the Russians are Europeans, not like Florence Gaub, that NATO propagandist claims, saying they are not Europeans. That is all nonsense. They belong to European culture. Here, the memory of World War II is kept alive and it is present everywhere. We were up at the Gulf of Finland, heading towards Finland, and we swam there. The birch trees reach up to the beach. The water is cold. When we came back, we saw barbed wire in the bushes. He is rotting away there. And my friend said, yes, he has been lying there since World War II, since the Russo-Finnish War, since the Winter War. The remnants of World War II are visible and tangible everywhere here. Krista Wolf wrote in her novel, Patterns of Childhood, The past is not over. It is not even past. I noticed this in my own biography as well. Let me give you an example. I was in Kosovo in 1999 as a reporter. I was in the hospital in Prizren. There were two boys, 12 and 14, lying on completely blood-soaked sheets and in blood-soaked bandages. They wanted to scratch their feet, but there were no feet anymore because they had been amputated at the thigh. But there was no foot anymore, because they were oberschenkel amputated. And they didn't get it at all, not even nervously. These children wanted to smuggle weapons from Albania for the UCK into Kosovo. They couldn't even cry anymore. There was just this gurgling sound. When you've experienced something like that, first of all, you no longer fall for the propaganda of the warmongers. And secondly, you can never get rid of these images. Krista Wolf said, the past is not over, it is not even past. Sometimes I wake up at night and see these images. That's why it is a lasting task to deal with it, so that things do not repeat themselves. Those who do not know the past are forced to repeat it. That's the point. Um. I perceive this issue just as you do, and take it just as seriously. Therefore, I cannot understand how we can have people in Europe who actually stand in front of cameras and say that weapons are the way to peace. It saddens me that this exists, and that there are people who even affirm it, even if they do not say it themselves, but it is affirmed. As a researcher of international relations, I simply ask myself, Mr. Bath, do we have any influence on this? There is a Russell Brand, an English commentator, who talks a lot about world events. He also has a very large following and is very, very committed. And he once said in an aside, and I found that extremely brilliant, that these people, these warmongers, like the Stoltenbergs of the world, and the Bidens, and maybe also the Baerbocks and so on, are nothing more than the fleas in the fur of the dog of war. In the sense that these nations are moving, and we have the feeling that they are being controlled. But actually, these people are just the result of where we have already arrived. And actually, the beasts are no longer under control. Do you feel that not only the war, but also nations like Germany, the USA, and Russia are under the control of those who are actually in power? Or are we just observing the result of where we have been driven? Especially considering that we have now learned that Joe Biden is not responsible for what is happening in the USA. Do you have hope for a political correction of where we apparently are being driven?
ja, wo, wo wir hintreiben. Politiker sind die Flöhe im Fell des Krieges. Politicians are the fleas in the fur of war. We must mention the source here. I see it the same way. Shakespeare writes in the tragedy of King Lear, "'Tis the time's plague when madmen lead the blind." That is the curse of the times, when madmen lead the blind. Shakespeare recognized it, and we are in that stage. Let's stay on the level of the madmen. We have a still-serving president in the United States, about whom one can have justified doubts regarding his mental health. We will soon have as the EU's foreign representative a Ms. Kallas from Estonia, who can be described without exaggeration as a fanatic. Your predecessor in office, Borrell, speaks of the EU as civilization, with the rest out there being the jungle. I don't know if he has understood the developments of the past 20 years with BRICS+. Plus. These are people who in my eyes are characterized by what Sigmund Freud describes in his writings on narcissism. He describes two features of narcissism, megalomania and loss of reality. Where does economics minister Habeck get the audacity to travel to China and want to lecture them? An 80 million nation wants to lecture a 1.4 billion nation. That only elicits a cold grin in Beijing. Where does he get the audacity? Woher nimmt er die Schuss? Das ist garantiert die Ansage, die man da nicht hören will. Und das ist das Gegenteil. That is definitely the announcement that one does not want to hear. And that is the opposite of diplomacy. I want to say who is stirring this up. We have consistently transatlantically corrupted elites in Europe. And in my view, this has a lot to do with the second Iraq war in 2003. Back then, Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder, French President Jacques Chirac and Russian President Vladimir Putin decided not to participate in this illegal war of aggression by the Americans, which resulted in hundreds of thousands of deaths. And there was immediately a discussion about old Europe and new Europe. And new Europe, like Warsaw and so on, did participate and so on. And in Washington, within the neoconservative circles of the foreign policy establishment, it was decided that this must not happen again. We must enforce allegiance. And this is done by replacing personnel. Throughout Europe today, we see politicians who follow this American policy because they have made their careers in transatlantic organizations or are connected to transatlantic organizations. Sigmar Gabriel, Atlantic Bridge, Annalena Baerbock, Young Global Leaders. Take a look at France, Macron and his now resigned Prime Minister Attal. These are people who have been socialized in international banking. They have more to do with their colleagues in international banking than with their own population. They are not interested in that at all. It is a transnational elite that travels around the globe to produce a few nice TV images for the people back home. Otherwise, they meet in their clubs, at their conferences, and for a pat on the back from Washington. They do everything for this because it satisfies their own need for recognition and their own career. That's how it is. This elite must be replaced before anything changes. Und diese Elite muss abgelöst werden, bevor sich etwas ändert. Und das macht man in Demokratien mit dem Wahlzettel oder indem man von seinem Recht Gebrauch macht. And that is done in democracies with the ballot or by exercising the right to peacefully assemble in the open air. There is no other way. With these figures, there will be no more peace in Europe. I wish these people, that so to speak, a regiment is put together, not even for frontline duty, but perhaps for collecting body parts behind the front. That is salutary. And of course, these people are also driven. If you look at the specialist literature, you can show, economically and sociologically, that in all developed industrial nations of the West, the profit rate has been falling for about four decades. The profit rate is the ratio of profit to invested capital, and that is deteriorating for companies. This makes capital nervous. 
A decline in the profit rate can be countered, for example, by lowering wages, rationalization, reducing production costs, opening up new markets and expanding production, or by procuring cheaper raw materials. But also through a war, because war leads to the destruction of capital. Then the original accumulation can begin again. All these possibilities are offered by Ukraine. Black soil allows for expansive agricultural production, rare earths and raw materials that are cheap to procure. Seltene Erden, Rohstoffe, die billig zu beschaffen sind. Der selbsternannte außenpolitische Vordenker der CDU. The self-proclaimed foreign policy thinker of the CDU, Kiesewetter, has pointed out cheap labor and now the war. One must say, the war is driven by the exploitation pressures of capital. Let's take a look at who owns the companies in Germany. In almost all large companies and also in many medium-sized businesses, American financial investors are involved. Foremost among them are BlackRock, Vanguard, and the like. Now let's look at Ukraine. BlackRock and JP Morgan have signed a contract with the Ukrainian state that these two financial investors will manage Ukraine's national debt, so you can make money with debt. Also mit Schulden kann man Geld verdienen. Vor allem wenn man weiß, dass nachher die Belastungen alle Above all, when you know that afterwards all the burdens are shifted onto the European Union and its taxpayers. There are even commissions for management, and you can see who has an interest in this war. These are international financial investors. And because I am repeatedly asked, I am repeatedly labeled as a friend of Russia. Of course, Russia is a country with significant democratic deficits. But now let's take a look at the economy. It is also a neoliberal country. What is happening there? Russia is first of all a country with a shrinking population. The population is declining. This has a lot to do with the years of economic collapse under Boris Yeltsin. The parents did not have children. This has an impact over decades. Russia is a country with significant disparities, large differences between urban and rural areas. The country is enormous, the infrastructure needs to be renewed. You can travel very quickly by Intercity Express from St. Petersburg to Moscow in a few hours. But try going to Kazan, those are completely different distances. There is a very significant need for development. There is a backlog in the area of digitalization. The cities are exploding. In St. Petersburg, there is a land reclamation project on Vasilyevsky Island. Da gibt es ein Projekt der Neulandgewinnung auf dem Vasiljewski Island. Da werden mal auf einen Schlag 50.000 Wohnungen. 50.000 Apartments are being built at once. One would like to see that in Berlin. 50,000 Apartments. But it's not enough because the city is exploding. So there is a significant need for development. This means that the Russian economy and the Russian government are primarily focused on internal development. Russia is also a resource autonomous country. They don't need Ukraine the way the West needs Ukraine for its resources. Russia has a stable resource base. This means that Russia today is not an expansive empire. The war in Ukraine is, in my view, a preventive war against NATO's eastward expansion. So, the connection with capitalism is that capitalism in the West is driving the war in Ukraine to increase profit margins. In Russia, on the other hand, the profit of capital is actually achieved through domestic consumption and domestic development. <laughs> domestic economic development and domestic consumption. That is completely clear. There is still enough need for action, and there is absolutely no reason to expand here or to subjugate foreign nations to attack them. However, there is a geostrategic reason. The Russians naturally want to keep the military base, the naval base in Crimea, under control. That is, of course, clear. That is something different. But the economic development, that is what we are focusing on. Capitalism drives such wars. Yes, but you say that capitalism in Russia is not actually driving this war, but would rather promote internal development. So capitalism is more important as an explanatory basis for NATO's actions in the conflict.
Exactly. And also for the role of Russia. One must, of course, analyze Russian capitalism to understand what is happening there, because the economic factors are ultimately the decisive factors. The need for internal development is so great that the war in Ukraine hinders economic development. This is also confirmed to me by political scientists in Russia, by the way. I have spoken with them. They are people distant from the government. My circle of acquaintances in Russia is rather distant from the government. This must also be considered. We are approaching an hour of conversation, but I value this too much to stop now. I still need to ask something, and that is this paradox. Even in the USA, the need for internal development is extremely high. When you hear that currently 20 million people live below the poverty line and the infrastructure is in poor condition, you wonder why Western capitalism does not meet this need. People like Jimmy Dore repeatedly say that people live under bridges and these are not even being repaired. How do you explain that Western capitalism does not meet internal needs but always seems to expand outward and invest in wars and the military-industrial complex? I explain this with the dominance of the military-industrial complex in the United States. The United States spends almost $900 billion a year on armaments. They are the strongest military power and have 11 aircraft carriers. They earn billions from the Ukraine war. This return, generated through wars, is greater than the possible return that can be achieved through domestic consumption. But here too, the Biden administration is countering with the Inflation Reduction Act. So, there are comprehensive tax breaks and subsidies for corporations here, which leads to many companies relocating their manufacturing to the United States, such as Daimler-Benz or Linda. This also stimulates domestic economic development in the United States. I completely agree with you. There is a significant need for action here. But the industry will only meet this need if the margins are right. And the margins are currently significantly lower than in the defense sector. That is the background. So ultimately, capitalism is also a driving force behind what is happening here. In Russia, the arms industry is much more under political control, as far as I can judge from a distance. So it is a completely different arms model that Russia operates compared to that of the USA, isn't it? No, not quite. The Russians were also, at least before the war, arms exporters and made money in the arms sector. The export of the Russian Federation had two strong drivers, the arms industry and raw materials. They rested on these laurels, which led to the manufacturing industry, such as automobile production, not reaching the level in their own country that would have been possible. This is now proving to be a disadvantage. Russian economists and political scientists confirm that the developmental deficits are not being caught up and that the war is making it more difficult. This affects both digitalization and investments in the manufacturing industry. All right, Mr. Barth, that was a very insightful and extensive conversation. If the people who are listening to you now want to follow you or read your writings, is there a place where you publish regularly? On Twitter, Substack? or somewhere else where people can follow you. You can find updates from me on my website, patrickbarb.de. It is not completely up to date, I can't keep up. I currently don't have a blog, that's a task for the future. I publish my books with West End Verlag, they are also available there. <laughs>
On both sides of the front, my travels to Ukraine and the new book, Propaganda Press, have been published by Hintergrund, but are also available on Amazon. And of course, I publish particularly in the new media, Nachdenkzeiten, Overton Magazine, where dissidents in Germany can still publish. Also in the Swiss Weltwoche, of course. I just want to make it clear at the end that I welcome the peace efforts in Kiev and Moscow by the Hungarian Prime Minister Orban. I explicitly welcome that. Unlike what is being said in Brussels or even here in Berlin, there must be a peace solution. I fully agree with Orban on this. We need to realize that people are dying here. On the Ukrainian side alone, there are more than half a million dead so far. I can only warn everyone against continuing down the path of war, because then at some point our children will also be staring out of body bags, even here in Germany. The warmongers will always continue if people do not show them a stop sign. This requires a strong peace movement. Fortunately, there are still voices for peace. Viktor Orban, I can only congratulate him, and I thank Hungary from the bottom of my heart for doing this. Viktor Orban is currently, as we speak, on this Monday, July 8th, in Beijing and talking with Xi Jinping. Starting tomorrow, or the day after, he will be in Washington, at the NATO summit. If there is someone who is present in all committees and participates in every event, it is Viktor Orban. And if there is someone who can pull the strings together, it is Hungary. I pray that the Hungarians succeed in this endeavor. Mr. Barth, would you like to add anything? Willy Brandt said, peace is not everything, but without peace, everything is nothing. And therefore my allies are all those who are committed to ending the war. This federal government apparently is not. Patrick Barth, thank you very much. Thank you.